Two in a row. Teacher talk. Coming in hot. Um, wanted to just sort of wrap up this little sexuality, everybody's favorite sexuality thing that uh, that we've been that I've been posting about um, this week with Seinfeld, which is not typically, I think, where you people would normally look for um, their cues on uh, sexuality and things like that. But I, that episode, the outing I had you guys watch, I think, just does. It does a really good job of a bunch of things. And then Boy Meets World is a totally different perspective that I'll get into. And then finally Shit's Creek um, is a more contemporary kind of look at um, sexuality that kind of says, like, who cares, right? Which should have been what we were saying in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Like, who cares? Who cares what you like to fuck? It just it shouldn't shouldn't really matter, um, unless that person is trying to have sex with you and you don't want to. Like, why is you know why does anybody care? I guess what what's our obsession with it? Um, is a, is a fair question to ask. Um, so I got a bunch of comments from you guys on Seinfeld. Not much on the others, but that's okay. Um, so the Seinfeld thing, um, you guys hit on some some of the key uh, the key concepts and and some stuff that I really hadn't thought about. But um, here's here's just some of my notes on it. So this is 1994. This is the pivotal um, Seinfeld season. Most people who've watched Seinfeld point to this fourth season as... Wait, is it the fourth? I can't remember. Um, they point to this season as the turning point. Um, and where the show kind of just steered away from like a traditional sitcom setup and moved into this sort of, they just, they experimented with the form, I guess. Um, doing like bottle episodes, which really weren't a, a thing. Like the Chinese restaurant episode where they, the entire episode is them waiting for a table at a Chinese restaurant. Um, the contest, um, a bunch of episodes there just were different. It had a different approach. And this, I think, fits in with that. If you watch early Seinfeld stuff, first season is, it's, it's brutal. It's tough to watch. Um, yeah, there's some Seinfeld quips and bits from his stand-up that are funny, whatever. But... Season two and three are hit and miss. Like some episodes are really good, some are just like unwatchable. And then it seemed like season four, they're like, "Fuck it, let's do what we want to do," right? And history was changed. Basically, they honestly in ninety four, season four, they probably started letting Larry David sort of take the reins a little bit more, gave him a little more leeway. Um, creatively. So in the mid 90s, you guys might know this, but might not. P it, it was really the birth of PC culture, right? And coming up with ways to um, just sort of uh, just sort of pacify a culture that was sort of looking for answers, I guess. Um, and sexuality was no different. Like many of you mentioned, like it was a different, like this was kind of groundbreaking to have this episode, to be talking about this. Like should we be talking about it? 
it kind of coincides with Ellen. Like Ellen had a sitcom on network TV on ABC, and it was pretty popular as she was a popular stand-up, but she was not out of the closet yet. And then I think it actually started in 94. And then in 97, she came out of the closet both on the show and in real life. And all hell broke loose. So it was still this kind of taboo um, topic. So the a bunch of you mentioned this too. The addition of the line, not that there's anything wrong with that, was a Larry David um, a Larry David device. Initially, the script called for them to say it once. The first time that they're accused and they're talking about it, they say it. That's it. And then Larry's suggestion was every single time that the your sexuality comes up or that someone accuses you of being gay or whatever, we're going to say the line. And... It changes the whole episode, I think, and makes it not only about sexuality, but about um, and being more accepting. Um, use, to use some of your terms, um, Jeff Jeff brought up like perception is reality, that kind of thing. Um, confronting how others see you, I think it's totally about that. That's a good way to to say that. Um, and then Emma mentioning, you know, doing this all without blatantly moralizing the whole topic, which is, which frequently happens. Um, so what it does is it comments on that PC culture, right? Um, and it also comments on our ideas about sexuality. And it's it's a brilliant, just a subtle, but brilliant choice um, that Larry David made that I think takes this to um, another level. Um, you know, Seinfeld, you, you may have heard it referred to as the show about nothing. Um, that's obviously not true. It's funny, I once had a kid... He was doing a presentation on Seinfeld. So he comes up to the front of the room and he goes, he, he says, I don't have anything because it's a show about nothing. Like he literally thought that the show was literally about nothing. <laughs> like how dumb do you have to be, right? So... <laughs> That was sort of a, I talked about this in the Always Sunny video, right? There's little things that comedy does to sort of throw you off the scent of meaning. Um, and it's easy to get, like, it was an entire marketing campaign to call it a show about nothing. Meanwhile, it's about something, and it's doing this every week. The something is maybe getting overlooked, and they're able to... Um, again, like have these, these deeper discussions about life and sexuality in this case, without sounding the alarms of homophobes or bigots or, um, whatever. Right. Um, so in the episode, like the specifics of the episode, um, you have like the Simpsons, uh, the Simpsons episode you watch this generational reaction to their sexuality. Jerry's mom and dad think it's because they bought him a pair of girls' pants culottes when he was a kid. Like their understanding of sexuality is that that's all it takes. It hinges on like what your you wear, right? Um, that's always an interesting dynamic. And George's mom, like, falls off the toilet when she finds it. <laughs> like, <laughs> but they all add, not that there's anything wrong with that. And it seems like every time they say it, 
right? It's not only literally calling attention to why why do we make so much of a big deal about this, but it's also a comment on why do we even have to say not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, so I think that's just brilliant. Um, so you, this is kind of like the who's the boss episode too, right? Um, it's everything's fine until the outside world or the culture around you points at you and says you're doing it wrong or you're doing it you're weird or you're um there's something wrong with you right um how the culture kind of shapes our choices and this is kind of back to, to jeff's idea right how we see ourselves versus how we are seen um the whole lead up to the accusation we we we're watching this episode we're not laughing at george's behaviors right when he says oh i don't like my voice on tape it just sounds so high and whiny right um the shirt he asked Jerry about the shirt. We don't think twice about it. Um, washing the pair. We don't think twice about it. The Bette Midler CD or the guys and dolls tickets. The Bette Midler CD is going to take a steam. Like all that stuff happens and we don't think anything of it until they're accused of being gay. Now we look back and we start saying, oh my God, that is. Right? We start to rethink all of our choices, right? All of what we know about this person, George in this case, um, most specifically, because he violates all these different things. There's nothing gay about any of that until the accusation, right? So that's the outside world. And in this case, many of you guys sort of pointed this out, Jeff and Chloe, like specifically this idea that the, the media's involvement in this, right? Which is very much, I think, and a contemporary, a 2024 look at that. The media's role in all of this, like taking a narrative and running with it because it's, it's kind of a scoop, right? And this little NYU reporter was like, oh, I got this big scoop and I can run with it even though it, I know it's not true. Um, so like manipulating narratives pushing false narratives, like how the media can play a role in all of this. But um, I think that is such a huge, a, a huge commentary on all of this is the way we interpret George and Jerry's relationship before the accusation and after the accusation. And of course, we're, you know, we're behind the fourth wall. So we understand that this is the same woman that overheard them talking and all that kind of stuff. That's what, that's what makes it funny. Um, you also have George, George's physical reaction versus his verbal reaction. Right? George can say not that there's anything wrong with that. All he wants. His physical actions don't indicate that there's nothing wrong with it right he's out of his mind right have sex with me right now have sex right he's jumping up and down i'm not gay i'm not gay like he's so physically i mean he's like jumping up and down and he's running all over the place but he's saying not that there's anything wrong with that so the that there's there's something there's some study out there about um like nonverbal communication versus ver verbal communication and like how much we trust each and verbal communication we trust way less than physical than nonverbal basically um which I think goes back to what I said a few of these ago. 
uh, this idea that you know you can say all the right things and mean none of them. But at the same time, I don't think George is a homophobe by any means because I, I had this um, Adama kind of touched on this. Um, nothing's worse than being misrepresented, right? Like that is frustrating. That can make you angry. Jerry seems to handle it better. Like, he's not as phased by it as George, this accusation that he's gay. Um, but at the same time, like, nobody wants to be, whether it's your sexuality or whatever, no one wants to be misrepresented, right? Um, or misunderstood in that kind of way. So you could, it's understandable that George is like, wants to clear the air or whatever. Um, but his physical versus his verbal reaction is always interesting. <clears throat> and then you get to, um, who said it? Um, Charlie. Uh, Charlie used the term turning point. Um, yeah, you're right. Like 94, like this era, mid 90s was a turning point culturally, right? With PC culture. I don't know which way the turn was going <laughs> in a positive or a negative direction. Um, probably a little of both. But this episode, as Charlie mentioned, makes hopefully makes us, the audience, consider our prejudices and arbitrary social stigmas. So that ties in with Jerry's side of this. Right, so Jerry's kind of used to it because he's single, thin, and neat. Right, all things that aren't, you know, aren't gay inherently. Um, there are single, thin, and neat straight people too. Right, um, that he's kind of used to it. He's like, yeah, I, I hear that all the time. Maybe that's why he's not acting like George is. Um, but that, that you can boil sexuality down to be, being single, thin, and neat, right? Um, and then they turn that when Kramer comes in. And he read, he has read the paper and he is just, you know, he's outraged that Jerry's been hiding this from him, right? Um, and, and immediately believes what he's read in the paper right he's known jerry for years and years and he knows he's not gay but as soon as it's in the paper boom believes all of it he's like how could you keep this from me right he's like well you're single mid-30s right thin whatever and jerry it goes so are you and his whole his head explodes, right? Um, so that's to um, back to Jeff's point about the power of labels and the power of perception, right? Um, Kramer's how if Jerry by this by this standard, if Jerry is gay, so must be Kramer, right? So and Kramer's like, oh shit, wait, you know how'd you? that's not right you know um so there's all that going on at the same time um and then at the end george is gay when it suits him right he wants out of this relationship so he then appropriates gayness to hopefully to his benefit, but there's, you know, the woman like leans into it, I guess. Right. Um, so there's, there's that aspect of it uh, too. Um, oh, here's, I literally said, Charlie said, arbitrary social stigmas. I said, we judge sexuality by arbitrary factors, single, thin, neat, late thirties, all that kind of stuff that they mention in there. Um, yeah, this is from the groundbreaking season four, as I mentioned at the top. So there's all that going on. 
And then, you know, this is this is when it was really Larry David's. I think Larry David took more control over how the show looks and what they were doing. The hospital scene where George visits his mom, who he put in the hospital, it's so good. Like, also this self-referentiality that Seinfeld kind of pioneered, where the the world of the, of the show has a history. Like, you you know, like things that have happened. You know, a typical sitcom is that the episodes are are it's not serialized basically episodes stand on their own like you you have a you have a conflict and a crazy situation and then you solve it hilariously and then you go to another one the next time you're never you're never like oh hey remember when that happened so Seinfeld started to do that like this world exists and it it's going on as they are going on so anyway the contest episode is about who can hold out from masturbating the longest. So in the midst of that, George is in the hospital visiting his mother, who uh, fell down, hurt her back when she caught him masturbating. So mm-hmm. they're in the, it's the exact same scene, almost word for word dialogue, except in that scene, it's a guy giving a guy a spot. A, a, two women giving each other a sponge bath and then here in this one where he's accused of being gay it's two men giving a sponge bath mm-hmm. exact scene um, that's just that's just fun stuff um, so I mentioned their reactions to this accusation Chloe brought that up um, the media is a great addition um, to this discussion. The media perspective and narratives. Um, Jeff and Chloe mentioned that. Um, I mentioned Charlie Grace. I thought Grace's Seinfeld as ally was good because it's hard. I think it's hard to to take a negative away from this. Um, this episode in terms of its relationship to this, you know, this discourse on sexuality in the mid nineties. Um, and it's kind of, I liked what she said about the veteran who says, you gave me the courage to come out and how meta that could be that hopefully that happened, but the episode itself helped maybe some people um, get to that point. So I think that's another uh, thing to think about and a great spot to jump into Boy Meets World, right? Um, So I'll give you my Boy Meets World theory. So this this lecture, I do this whole thing on Boy Meets World, and you know, 15 years ago, it blew people's minds, right? Because 15 years ago, I had all the students that grew up watching Boy Meets World obsessively. I'm, you know, um, on TGIF, ABC's TGIF lineup, and they were obsessed with Corey and Topanga, and it was this this whole thing. Um, and I watched it plenty, and then going back, I sort of developed this theory that ruffled a lot of students' feathers <laughs> at the time. But on further sort of examination, I think they all know that I'm right. So I'm just going to outline the theory and give you examples from the episode, which there were a couple comments. I don't think you guys watched the right episode. Maybe I gave you the wrong episode. But the episode where I that I had you watch, like 
they were broke. Corey and Topanga were broken up. So he's not cheating on her by any means. Um, so, anyway, this is my theory. It's pretty simple. Boy Meets World is the battle between Topanga and Cor and Sean over Corey's sexuality. Discuss. Now, this for the most part, people these 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 students, you know, 10, 15 years ago, outraged. How dare I? But it's not not pejorative. I'm not saying like and they're going to hell because of it. Like, no. It make it arguably makes the show better if I'm right. If that's the case, that Corey and Sean are um, somehow Topanga and Sean are pulling Corey back and forth between being straight or being gay, and this is the time when that kind of happens when when kids are confused and you know don't even know what sexuality is. But they have feelings, and they're working through them, right? Th this show takes place, I think they're in, like, they're mostly in middle, like, the, the meat of the show is they're, like, 6th, 7th, 8th, like, middle school age. And it's called Boy Meets World. Like, there's an element to this that 100% is about, this is when this happens, um, more than anything. So here's, I then proceed to go through this list of things from the episode that sort of support my, my claim. Um, one, Sean's obsession with Corey hooking up, right? Now, I'll put a pin in that. I'll take a step back. Sean's uh, Sean's sort of lady killer persona is a classic beard situation. He doesn't know what to do with his gayness, and he's certainly not ready to come out of the closet. So he has to fool everybody. He thinks he has to fool everybody by constantly being with, the, with girls and kissing girls. and Like, he's obsessed with it. And that's, that's closeted homosexuality 101. Um, so then he's obsessed with Corey. So Corey's not with Topanga. And he's obsessed with him being with someone else. You have to kiss somebody. You have to. Let's go on a date. You have to kiss somebody. What are you doing? Why? Like, I think that's weird. And sometimes when I ask people, isn't that weird? They're like, no. And I'm like, really? Like, you're that sort of adamant about someone else? Your friend kissing somebody or having sex with some or whatever? Like, that seems really weird to me. Um, so there's that element of it. And if you watch the episode, the right episode... Um, there's no better indication that uh, Sean is gay and Corey's maybe than when he's like, we need to go on a double date. And Corey's like, okay. And Sean's like, really? Yeah. And they go, hey. And they call two girls randomly walking by. Hey, do you guys want a double date tonight? And they're like, yeah, sure. Like, when has that ever happened in the world ever? Two teenage boys just like, hey, you guys want to go out? Yeah. Okay, see you at the date. Never. Never. Why? Because they're both like, oh, of course, let's just go out with them. It'll be free dinner. They're gay. <laughs> like, <laughs> they're no threat to us. Like, that. that's my, that's my point. So that was another one. Um, there's several lines that Sean delivers to Corey in the course of the show. Um, I think I lost you, man. Um, 
That's the other one. It's not easy to hold a guy and pick a lock. Um, that sounds eerily suggestive. Um, there's also a moment. Oh, geez, I forgot about Turner. So Turner is the guy with all in the denim and the mullet. And he's like this 30s bachelor. He's single, thin, and neat, basically. Um, but he's a very Fonzie type. If you guys don't know who Fonzie is, uh, from Happy Days, a show that was on in the 70s, about the 50s, right, Fonzie is kind of this gay icon. He never came out, he's not officially, but just over time, you know, he just sort of, he had the whole um, ladies' man thing, His his but his office was the men's room at Al's, the local restaurant. So anyway, Fonzie has this sort of gay icon status. And it's up for debate whether he was gay or not. Who knows? But Turner is certainly a Fonzie-type character. And he ends up taking Sean under his wing. And Sean lives with him because his family is a broken home. And there's another there's another red flag. Um, so he lives with Turner at his apartment. So you're like, okay, this is... There's something, there's something he, here at play um, that's going on. So they're talking. Co Sean has carried Corey back to Turner's apartment. And he, it's hard to hold a guy and pick a lock. And then they're having this conversation. And it's like those conversations we've talked about, like Theo and Dr. Huxtable. Like these metaphor, these sort of metaphoric conversations, and Corey says, "I don't want this, Sean." He's talking about something else, but he could be talking about, "I don't want to be with you," right? And Sean's sort of heartbroken. I don't want this, right? What What don't you want, Corey? You don't even know what you don't want anymore. Um. Sean says, now I've lost them again. Um, there's also a, a storyline in the show that Sean moves in. Before he moves in with Turner, he moves in with the Matthews. Like, of course. You're having trouble at home. Move in with your best friend and his, you know, his brother and sister and parents. Like, they love you, all that kind of stuff. That didn't work. He lasted like one night and he ran away. Why? Because it was too much for him. He's confronted with his sexuality blatantly, right? Sleeping right next to him is Corey. And he has all this shit going on and he doesn't know what to do with it. Like, that's the only explanation I can come up with. This is why, like, that would be a dream to live with your best friend. Unless you were, you know, conflicted and confused and all those kinds of things um a lot of people like to bring up the turk and jd relationship as a counterpoint to the sean and Corey one say well it's just like turk and jd but it's not it's just not turk and jd their their sexuality or their gender or whatever their gender bending their bromance is the butt of the joke. And there's no there's no joking about this whole Sean Corey thing. Um so Corey I don't think knows what's going on, but Sean is is clearly like grappling with this, I guess. Um getting dates instantly um, Sean's stud reputation he's afraid people will find out that he's gay um, they spend time I mean the, the teen hangout where they go and with their dates and make out in the booth and they're playing pool and Sean pinches him on the ass pinch me I'm not on the butt he says 
like all that, you know, the name of this place that they're constantly hanging out with. It's it's hard to it's Chubby's. Chubby's is the name of the place. I hope you guys all know what a Chubby is. Um so the Turner thing as sort of a gay mentor, I mean if you're looking at it through this um the butt pinch, it's just right there. <laughs> all that stuff. Um, and then, you know, I don't know if it's in there. I'll have to, maybe I'll post the picture. Picture of them on the DVD case is them literally coming out of the closet. They're lockers, but they're, Sean is coming out of, and Corey are coming out of the closet. That's my closer. Like, that's what I usually show, but <laughs> two little anecdotes about it. Um, again, I, I should have prefaced this earlier but it doesn't make it a bad show I'm not complaining about this part of it I think it's fantastic and these two stories I'm going to tell you sort of will contribute to that like you couldn't be we just talked about this with Seinfeld like this show was on in the late 90s like you couldn't have an openly gay teenage character on TV on Friday night on ABC there's just, there's no way. But they did. They did it the only way they could, by coding in a certain way, by writing in a very specific way. And, like, it was kind of like the show was in the closet, if that makes any sense. Um, because it, it had to be. And this is why... Um, I think Girl Meets World, I think Chloe brought up Girl Meets World, kind of failed. Like, they had this opportunity now, because they made it, when they make it, 2018 or something. Like, the world was totally different. Certainly in our perceptions of different you know, sexual orientations and things like that. Like, they had an opportunity to bring Sean back and say have him be a gay character and be like, yeah, I was in love with your dad. Like, whatever. Like, they they could have done that. And they kind of just tiptoed around the whole thing. Anyway, two stories. So, one, a, a student of mine named Ben, this was years, probably 10, maybe like, maybe 14 or 15 years ago. He took the class. This is very class. We start talking about Boy Meets World, and you know I'm going through my whole thing, and he raises his hand and he goes, "You are 100% right." Now Ben, I knew him, um, just through class and stuff, and he was gay, and he was out of the closet, so he was gay, and he he talked for about five minutes in the middle of this class about how the show was so important to his sexuality growing up. Now, he, here's a teenager watching a TV show where he, we talked about representation all semester, all session, and he saw himself in Sean, like a character that was clearly struggling with something and it was probably his sexuality and how he acted and how difficult it was and frustrating and all those kinds of things he like it helped it helped me through a lot of it because I could relate and it it was speaking to me on this very level that you're that I was trying to explain and I, what, how much, you know, what better endorsement do you need? Um, and actually, Ben, he actually used to come back to Binghamton. I would tell him when we were watching Boy Meets World, he would come back and, and come up in front of the class and, you know, talk for a few minutes about that kind of, that thing. 
Um, another kid, same same situation. He was gay. His name was Vance. His, he was gay, and he was. We're, we had just watched Boy Meets World, and we're talking about it. We're doing this whole thing. He's sitting over here to my to my left. There's like five minutes left in class, and I'm like, I'm just looking for an ally here, <laughs> looking for somebody to support me. I didn't want to put him on the spot as like you're the gay guy, like you speak for everybody. So I make eye contact with him. I'm like, nothing, Vance. You're not going to help me out. <laughs> He's like, oh, hey. oh, oh. I mean, I guess. He's like, okay, well, I've never seen the show before, but within the first, but by the end of the first scene, I knew Sean was gay. Like, just based on everything. Like, I've seen that guy a thousand times, right? Growing up um, as a gay as a gay kid. Um, I've seen it a thousand times, and that's, I mean, it's textbook. It's textbook. So those are my two references, I guess, for my, my gay theory. Um, hopefully that helps you a little bit <laughs> um and then i guess i'll do this shit i mean i'll do the shit's creep thing quickly like i like the way i love the way the show just out of hand like it's like a modernized take on the riches to rags story um like, I just like how it's it's a it's about sexuality, but not about it at all. In in kind of the way um, Cosby is about race, but he never mentions race. This is similar, right? So Dan Levy wrote the show and created the show, stars in the show, and he's just sort of like. Pansexual, I think they bring up in the episode, just like just sort of like fluid, right? Like again, it's like who cares? Um, and there's the the sort of famous scene where he and Stevie are picking out wine and talking about the wine, using the wine as a metaphor. You know, I like the wine, not the label, right? Like because he has sex with Stevie, he has sex with women, he has sex with men, he has, you know. Just whatever. Um, but the the sort of subtext of the whole show is that they you know they move into this redneck rural town, and no one in the town like their their sexuality comes up so little over the course of the series that it's it's almost shocking. Because it's saying, like, this is sort of this, this, like, sexual, sexuality utopia where a guy like Dan Levy, or David, in this case, David Rose, can just show up to this town and not be discriminated against, not be looked at funny, not be ignored, or just be, sort of, like, accepted. Um, and... That, in and of itself, is, I think, a testament to the progress that, we, that we've that we made. Um, I said, yeah, it's a sexual utopia. It's never mentioned. People aren't defined by their sexual preference, which is like, I, I say that all the time. I mean, not all the time, but I say, like, who you like to fuck, like, your sexual, your sexuality is the least interesting thing about you, like, from my experience, like, who cares, like, it, it, it just, but we make it the first thing, right, like, that's, seems to be where we make a lot of our judgments about who you are, and then we go from there, and it's usually in a shitty direction, um, So, 
that's my it's it's this two Americas coexisting thing too. Right. And it came out you know, during, you know, one of the worst times for that. Because you have the roses who are super rich, they've had everything handed to them for the most part. And they're thrown into Shit's Creek, which is just, you know, it's this other America, right? It's it's America. And they completely coexist. It seems like a lot of the bullshit that pulls people apart is either diffused or evaporated. Um, which I think is uh, another one of those just like subtextual things. They're not sort of beating you over the head with this idea. Um, you know, and then David's character, like, I wrote, this is one of my notes. He's an experiment in being a person, right? Um, like, how do you, how would you define him, right? Um, and conversely, why do you feel like you have to define him, right? In terms of, like, we want to put him into a box. Why? Like enough with the enough with the boxes. Um, it's a subversion of ideology, basically, um, and Alexis, on the other hand, isn't a person. I feel like she can only exist in one world, basically, um, and she's completely desensitized to the whole thing. So. The big thing from that is the scene again, the wine scene, right? I like the wine, not the label. Um, no gender. Right? Gender is kind of a, again, a construction. You know, I don't know. No, 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 no. Anyway, do what you must. Do what you will with that information. Hopefully you'll do something good with it. Um, papers Sunday. Or before, if you got it done. If you're one of those people. Bye.